Hi there, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's great to have you here and thanks for giving your time um, for this project to select some art. Um, thought it'd be great just to ask you a few questions about mm -hmm. the connection between nature, people, creativity and how those, those bonds can be made through that kind of creative practice. Hmm. and what your thoughts are on that. Um, hmm. So just to start off with, do, do you have any early memories of nature in books or in films or poetry that's, that's inspired you or do you think it's had an influence on you? I, I, one of the strong memories I have from, from being a child is, is absolute fascination with the natural world. And one of the ways into that for me in those days was um, the Ladybird books. Right. Um, those, uh, beautiful little uh, gems of, of publications that not only had nicely written text to to explain some of the, the nature that one could see in the garden, but also the most beautiful paintings. And actually, the, it's funnily, mm. funnily enough, I finished up having the pleasure of writing such a book uh, much right. later in life on climate change. And certainly that was an inspiration for me was that format. Um, yeah with clear information with, with short format text and uh, those little paintings going alongside and you know the visual and the words together certainly made a bigger impression than either on its own. Yeah I suppose something like that's so accessible to so many people um, which is obviously really important and that's kind of what we were trying to do with uh, these events that we ran was to try yeah. and bring in people in a, in a new way to nature to try and make it relevant to them again. Um, so do you do you have any creative practices that you do that are do you paint or write poetry i know i know you're a writer but do you do anything kind of um i, I used to paint uh, a fair bit years ago but but i've got out of the habit of doing that i, I take mm. photographs on them out of things that i think are appealing and beautiful I'm not very good at it um but I, I guess you know the most crazy thing i i have done in recent years is, is to be a writer Mm. And, you know, the, the, although writing non-fiction subjects, I, I sometimes think that what I'm trying to do is, is to convert technicalities and, and scientific material into English and to do it with stories. And actually, this has been a really notable uh, part of the nature conservation discussion over recent years is this whole new genre of nature writing, which seems to have, have broken onto the scene, which is absolutely fantastic and I think mm. is bridging you know, what has been quite a big chasm between culture and science. And, you know, many of us who've worked in conservation over recent decades, you know, we come from uh, uh, disciplines of ecology and ornithology and biology and botany and all these subjects where, you know, we, we tend to start with a technical background. And I think, you know, it's taken a while for us to start translating that work into a more culturally resonant dialogue, uh, which of course is, is how things happen. You know, politics is, is a reflection of culture and, and politics and policy is what determines the priority that's attached to nature conservation or not. And so connecting that bit of the circle uh, is, is really, really important. And so this is why you know, the work you're doing with, with this art project is so important uh, because quite a lot of this stuff, it, it can be the domain of ecologists and not really break out. And if it continues like that, obviously we're not gonna do what we need to do. Yeah, completely. I mean, bringing more people in to this conversation, to the issues. Yeah. The only way that real change is gonna happen, it has to be driven by the public completely. Um, so moving moving sort of more to the conservation side now, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing species conservation, so for specific species? So um, I suppose, uh, yeah, my, my, my immediate reaction to that is, is, is the degradation of ecosystems. So, so species never exist in isolation. They're always part of a wider system and more or less interconnected with, with other elements in it. And you, the more you, you interfere with the, the threads of nature, the more likely it is for particular ones to snap and for the whole system to unravel. And so I think this has been a, a lesson that, that we've all learned in conservation over the decades is, you know, the focus on species is essential in drawing attention to issues and in being able to create icons and, and cause celebs that people can understand. Uh, but which in the end, you know, we only ever win those, those, those causes if we protect and restore the entire system. And so, you know, the, look at the tiger in India. Yes, you, mm. you, know, you, you, you need to conserve the tropical rainforest. There's no doubt about that. And so it goes uh, for, for the blue butterflies in Britain. You have to conserve the grasslands and the ants that live in those grasslands. 
in order for those animals to complete their life cycle. And so it's about restoring ecological integrity in the end is, is what species conservation ultimately needs to be geared to. And I, I think, you know, we, we've done a very good job through Back from the Brink uh, in being able to, to make those connections to show that the species actually are part of something bigger and we have to protect the something that's bigger in order to succeed. Yeah, yeah, completely. Make it, making the, the smaller, more obscure, something that's relevant and part of that ecosystem and important to save. Yeah, completely, completely. Um, so do, do you think there's a challenge in prioritization and what to save? How do you decide that? Yeah, un undoubtedly, I mean, conservation struggles at, at every turn with, with that process of, of, of what to focus on. And, you know, some of it is about the practicalities of like, you know, is this species so close to extinction now that there's no point in expending resources on it? And I, I was confronted with that question uh, in, in uh, a past life when working on the world's endangered parrots and the species that was one of our top priorities was the Spix's macaw. And we discovered mm. it had a wild population of a single individual. And so we had a long, hard conversation about whether we should spend any more resources on it, given that it did look like it was doomed. Actually, mm. there were 13 in captivity and that captive breeding program has now led to you know the potential for a recovery in the future which just goes to underline just how difficult and how fine judgment calls those can be in terms of whether to to commit to something that looks like it's a lost cause or not so there's that level of prioritization but then you know there's there's, there's a more uh um intangible level of, of focus that comes from just what people are interested in and so you know a lot mm. of conservation over the years has focused on big dramatic animals so tigers and elephants get much more attention than, than less charismatic mammals that nobody might have heard of or or very few people will have heard of and so that's a constant challenge but then again you know you think to yourself well actually you know that may not be wrong because if conservation is a cultural construct as much as a, a scientific one then getting maximum cultural traction actually is something that, that is a good call and you know so the osprey in, in Scotland may be a good example in this country where the return of those birds became a very big conservation story and you know has had very major ramifications even though the osprey globally speaking is, is not a threatened species so mm -hmm. there you know there, there are lots of different levels to this and it's really quite tricky you know we start with the red data books and we can see what's critically endangered endangered and vulnerable and you know we can do that triaging of, of the case for, for different uh, animals and plants but then when it comes to what we actually focus on and what we actually do it is quite a tricky business and you know one that will never be perfect I, I think we can say yeah yeah um going back to the art side of things are you someone who obviously before lockdown um visited galleries or went to see music or theater a lot is that something you were interested in not so much, actually. Um, the, the odd gallery and, and, and uh, looking at wildlife art is something I, I would do here and there. Um, but but I, I, I tend not to spend a great deal of my time on that. I, I, I suppose my exposure to, to the art of nature is actually being out in it and uh, being outside yeah. and, and enjoying it firsthand. So that, that, that's where my passion has been um, for, for, for many, many, many years, lifelong, really. And, and so that's something that, that keeps me topped up and keeps me inspired is, is is going out and looking at the actual things. Yeah, I, I kind I feel it's it's something that is right there in front of us and has always been a part of interpreting and understanding and appreciating nature. Because wow. I, I I feel as though and this I I think this is correct, but some of the earliest artwork are depictions of nature in the in the natural environment, which I find fascinating yeah. um yes they are and you know well going back to cave paintings actually mm -hmm. one, one uh, time i i did engage with with the interface between science and art uh, was during the writing uh, of a book called parrots of the world which was published now in 1998 i believe and um you know 350 species and trying to disentangle uh the uh identification of, of sometimes quite close uh uh species and subspecies you know, it's a technical discipline at one level, but actually working with the artists to be able to depict that in a way where you can pick out the differences and, and show that mm. uh, with a level of beauty and attraction in the colour plates was actually really quite an interesting um, uh, process because, uh, you know, the, 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 the technical side of it, um, it becomes all the more appealing when the pictures are beautiful. Uh, and so, you know, I think wildlife artists uh, over the years, you know, they, they, they've shown 
um, you know, exemplary abilities in, in being able to capture something at a level where you can say, actually, it's accurate, and that is what we're looking at, uh, but at the same time to convey a level of beauty and, and attractiveness that, you know, may evade a, a very technical drawing that could just be done with arrows and, um, you know, very, very basic um, artwork. Mm. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the, the role of culture and the appreciation of people for mm. nature driving changes in policy mm. and ultimately, positively, hopefully, affecting nature. Do you think there's a, a bigger role for artists to, who are already depicting some of the biggest social issues mm. of our time? Do you think there's a bigger role for them to start depicting and showing Hmm. the threat of nature in music and art hmm. and poetry. Y yes, I do. Um, funnily enough, um, I was just reflecting the other day on, on the extent to which, you know, some of the ambitions we now have in the conservation community for, for nature recovery, uh, including the idea of rewilding. Hmm. How, you know, that makes perfect sense to us as ecologists and restoring, you know, the function in ecosystems so that they can begin to um, perform natural processes once more. We can make perfect sense of that. But for many people, you know, that is changing things in a way which, which are, you know, seen as quite negative. Uh, and so, for example, you know, some of our national parks recognised for their beautiful rolling green hills or, um, you know, heather moorlands with dry stone walls, you know, in, in many ways, they're ecological deserts, but they mm -hmm. still have enormous appeal. And the idea of those being scrubbed over and turning into um, regenerating natural woodland, for some people, this is an appalling prospect. And they see this as, as being, you know, against the um, traditions and the achievements of generations of farmers. And to that extent, you know, what we're dealing with there is a culture clash. So on the one hand, there's the rewilders, and on the other, there's people who, who see those landscapes as being perfectly beautiful as they are. And so how to bridge that cultural uh, gap, I think, actually, is a subject for art as much as it is ecological science. And I, I wonder, you know, if Britain's top landscape artists might be invited by the conservation community to paint some of those landscapes 50 years from now, assuming that rewilding worked and, you know, what we might have in the future. And mm -hmm. to depict those landscapes as beautiful, vibrant, full of value that they don't have at the moment. And I, I think that would be something that would lend itself very much to art because it's not something you can capture with a camera because it doesn't exist, but it could exist in the imagination. And so to be able to uh, draw that uh, bridge across those two worldviews using art, I think would be a very worthwhile project and maybe something for, for someone to think about. Mm, that sounds like a brilliant challenge to the artists now and in the future. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time again and for speaking to us um, and for picking all the art that you've chosen as one of our guest curators for pleasure. our Back from the Brink online gallery. So I really appreciate that. And thanks. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.